Good evening, everyone. All okay? All well? Uh, thank you for coming this evening. My name's Colm Fagan. I'm, I live in Aylesbury or on the outskirts of Aylesbury now. I've met all of you before, actually. So thank you for having us back. So Luke 10, verse 25, and it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, and likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Amen. Again, thank you for coming. Um, uh, I think it's my third visit here. I remember first meeting Brother Andy uh, back in Quainton. This is probably, what was it, 2017 maybe, 2018. I can't remember now. Uh, 2018 perhaps. And um, yeah, I always had great fellowship with um, Quainton Baptist Church in Quainton. And I know some of their believers will come here sometimes to fill, you know, the pulpit or the or the chairs here, regardless. And um it's good to come here and fellowship because I remember when I was always visiting Quainton, they'd mention Chartridge and they'd say, oh, it's near Chesham. I'd think, oh, okay, yeah. But when, when you actually have faces and names put to the church here, it's nice to actually um, personally get to know them because, again, it's just another name, another building that you don't know. So I'm glad that uh, we can meet together face to face. You remember those times where we couldn't? I was... Very tough, dark times, weren't they? But God was at work during that time regardless. If you'd, maybe you kept a, a ribbon there or a bookmark, but if you could go back to Luke chapter 10, and you'd know what we read to be the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's one of the most famous parables that Jesus taught, maybe the most irrelevant, but very, very well known. Some don't know the text that well. They just know the account or the story or the main points. But we know that when Jesus told this, he, it's only recorded in the Gospel of Luke. When he told it, he told it in response to a lawyer who knew the laws of God, very well educated, very well rehearsed man. But he would have knew what the scriptures said, of course, and tried to uphold them or that would have been his job, not necessarily a personal duty of his to honor God, but it was his job as a lawyer. But the reason why the Lord gives the parable to him of this good Samaritan man is because this lawyer was willing to justify himself before Christ. We're not told the reason why. It's probably a good thing because that, that way we can always take something from it. In my experience as a Christian, I've met hundreds of people that I've tried to witness to. I, the Lord saved me about 11 years ago, nearly 11 years ago now. And ever since he saved me, I look back in my own life and whenever I'm witnessing or dealing with other people, the amount of people that are always willing to justify themselves is immense, isn't it? You've probably met people like that. 
What's worse is when there's Christians that are willing to justify themselves in opposition to what the words of Christ actually say. And may God protect us and guard us from that, that we'd ignore Christ to justify our own way, our own perspective, our own traditions. But this lawyer, I don't think many people would go up to a certain lawyer at this time and say, no, no, you're wrong. I don't think most people would do that, even if they did. I've met many people that can argue and debate, even if they're in the wrong, they're very skilled with their words, and they can flip it and make the other person look like they're wrong. But what this man does to Jesus is incredible. If you look in verse 29, he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, who is my neighbor? Because the Lord says, well, what you should do is love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, this lawyer should have known this text because it's found in Leviticus chapter 19 in the Old Testament. He should have already knew that the Bible taught this without the Lord confirming it again in the New Testament. But he's willing to justify himself and he says, well, who is my neighbor? You see this multiple times in the New Testament. The Sadducees, they strung the Lord Jesus along and said, well, because they didn't believe in a resurrection, they were always willing to justify their stance or their position. So they say to Jesus, well, I mean, say if you have a man, he marries, she, a woman marries a husband, he dies. She marries again, he dies. She marries again and again and again and again. They all die. When she dies, whose husband would she be then, huh? As if to say, the resurrection is possibly couldn't be a case. There couldn't be an afterlife. There couldn't be a heaven. There's not a literal kingdom of God after someone dies. No, 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 because then you've got all these husbands and a wife. It doesn't make sense. Therefore, you must be wrong. But then he has to educate them and correct them. And I love the way he always does it. But Jesus taught a parable and he always did it with questions and parables, how he taught people using real life examples to teach people. I've preached from this text before in light of having compassion and God's compassion to us and how his compassion and mercy go hand in hand. Because you'll see later on, you're familiar with the text in verse 33. They, he says, well, you know, in verse 33, the Samaritan had compassion on him. And at the end of the parable, the Lord Jesus said, who was it um, that was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? At the end of the parable in the next page in verse 37. And he answered, he that showed mercy on him. There's always this that goes hand in hand every time. You know, like what we sang in Great Is Thy Faithfulness in Lamentations? His, faithful, his mercies are new every morning. Why? Because his compassions fail not. God's compassion and mercy go hand in hand to us. Thankfully so. But I'm not going to preach on that specifically today because there's so much in this text. And what spoke to me was how do I really love my neighbor? Do I really love my neighbor? And the text doesn't stop there, does it? How do we finish that off? You should love your neighbor as thyself. You love your neighbor as thyself. That means however you want to be treated, however you want people to deal with you, that's how you should deal with other people. Now, we all, we all know when we've been wronged. Believe me, if mankind knows anything, they know that there's some sense of justice. They know when they've been wronged, don't they? They don't always see their shortcomings, of course. We don't normally see our wrongdoing, do we? But we definitely know when something is wrong, we are grieved about it. We have a sense of justice on the inside that God has put inside us and you can't avoid. You can harden yourself to it, but you can't avoid it. So he willing to justify himself. I'm glad that he said this so that we got this parable. So if you look down with me uh, in verse 27. So... In verse 26, he says, what's written in the law? How readest thou? Because he said, what good thing should I do to inherit eternal life? So the Lord Jesus is going to bring him to the end of himself. The Lord Jesus basically gets him to keep the whole law, which no man can do. He doesn't say, if you keep the law, you'll go to heaven. In a sense, a man would go to heaven if he was sinless, right? Because sin is the transgression of the law. If you break the law, you've sinned, excludes you from the presence of God. But this man tried to justify himself in verse 27, 26, sorry, he says, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, thou, you personally, singular, you, Mr. Lawyer, if you want to be justified, if you want eternal life, you want to do something good in the eyes of God, you shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Not 99%, 1% not, because it ceases to be all, doesn't it? 
And by the way, I've read the scriptures many times now. When I see the word all, it always in context means all. Every time. All thy heart, all thy soul, all thy strength, all thy mind. It doesn't mean now and again you give God the odd thought here and there. Now and again you give God some commitment. You give God some lip service. You think about him or do good for him or to others. Now and again. No, no, no. All of your mind, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength. All of it. And then he says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. By the way, did you notice that he avoided the love thy God of all his heart, all his soul part? Did you notice that? He doesn't even acknowledge that because he knows he cannot possibly publicly convince everyone of this. He can't justify himself regarding that. But what he does try to do is this. He tries to justify himself by saying, well, I mean, yeah, you know, who is my neighbor? By the way, I mean, some of us have been good to our parents. Some of us have been good to friends. Some of us, we do love strangers as we possibly utmost can as ourselves, don't we? Some of us try our best to do that, right? This man, he's trying to justify himself and he says, who is my neighbor? Because he was probably thinking of some people in his mind that he has treated as they should be treated, as they should be um, de dealt with. But the Lord Jesus says, I'll tell you who your neighbor is. And then he brings him to the end of himself. Your neighbor is not someone who is close to you necessarily. Your neighbor's not someone of your kin or your household or your country or your nation or your club. The example given to us here is this. A certain man left Jerusalem, went to Jericho, he fell among thieves. I won't take too much time to go into the parable because I want to go to another parallel uh, text in the New Testament. By chance, there came down a certain priest. The priest avoided him. The Levite it said he even came to look upon him and then he went the other way. And then the Samaritan came and he'd he done his best. He sacrificed. He gave up his time. He bound up the man's wounds. He put him upon his beast. He paid for him to be looked after in a location. And he said, if there's anything more I can do, I'll repay. And he was neighbor unto him. The Samaritan was a stranger that would have never dealt with a man like this. Like just, just by default, you would not say they're neighbors. Just by default, you would not say the Samaritan is a neighbor with an Israelite. You wouldn't say that. No association would be the best thing for these people. But that's how they'd address it. But Jesus said, who was neighbor? And they said, well, the one that had mercy upon him. They didn't say the Samaritan, of course. They didn't even say Samaritan, did they? They just said the one that showed him good. So the Samaritan, the one that cared, was neighbor. The lawyer could not justify himself after this event because the lawyer wouldn't have done that to a stranger. Yea, not even a stranger, an enemy of his. Or someone he considered to be less human or less valuable. Or some people look at it like this. We do have classist systems around the world. I have a, a Christian friend of mine from India. He says it's the same in India. He says like, if, if even, even Christian circles, there's a big struggle among class systems. Like it, it's a struggle to, to even like, um, uh, if, if one of their daughters wants to marry someone from a different class to them, it's like completely frowned upon and pressures put on them into their society. You get this around the world as well. Now, we might not see it as this. There's Samaritans and there's Israelites. We might not experience stuff like this today. But all sorts of other people, they look at other people. And if you can dehumanize them to a degree, then it's justified that you don't have to do good to them. Have you ever thought, how do so many atrocities happen in the world? How did World War II, the atrocities of World War II, that horrible war, how did some of the atrocities take place there? If you can just withdraw yourself and think, this person isn't quite made in the image of God. They're not quite on the same level as me. Then to be consistent, you can truly justify your dealings with them negatively or, or a lack of positive dealing with them. You, you certainly can. But the lawyer couldn't justify himself after Jesus gives this parable. The Samaritan done good to this man. The Samaritan did good to him. Now, if it was you, by the way, you can do good to someone like this. If he gives probably the broadest example here because he gives someone in need their life has been threatened they're visibly hurting aching suffering okay if there's someone lying on the street I'm sure all of us would go out to their attention we wouldn't go out and think ah now let's check their driver's license uh, uh, yeah mm. yeah there are kind of people we'll go and help him we don't we don't tend to do that do we but go to James chapter 2 with me something a little bit more personal by the way, most of us would say, if someone needs help, yes, we should treat them as ourselves. If it was me lying there, I'd want someone to help me. So I would help someone else. But let's look at it in this light, because James 
gives us a bit more insight in his letter in the New Testament here. Just after the book of Hebrews, you come to the book of James chapter 2. When you think of James chapter 2, normally it's in regards to the faith and works issue. That's, that's from uh, verse 10 onwards for context to the end of the chapter. But there's this portion, verse 1 up to verse 9 in the book of James, that's normally missed out. The book of James isn't written to the novice Christians. It's a very, very heavy and sometimes scathing letter that he writes. Very convicting, very sharp, very straightforward letter that James writes. If you look here, my brethren, there's verse 1, James 2 verse 1. James says to the believers, by the way, I've, I've circled that. Every time it says my brethren in this book, I've circled it. And countless times, countless times it says my brethren. He's talking to believers. So he says, my brethren have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. So he's saying here, look, Christian man, Christian woman, Christian child, do not have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he even puts more emphasis on the Lord's name, the Lord of glory. Don't have his way, his example, his faith. By the way, it's talking about the way we walk. When it says the faith, it's talking about how we live, what we do. It's talking about, it categorizes everything that we believe and everything that who we are. Don't have that with respect of persons. That doesn't mean we have our way, our walk and talk with God and for God as a witness and ambassador in this world. It doesn't mean have it in disrespect of persons at all. No, no. it says don't have it in respect of persons. It means this. You do not favor one person above another person or diminish or put down one person below another person. That's what he means. Because most of us will think, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't treat this person mean and then this person good. La, 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 la. Sometimes we can positively do it. Sometimes we show great favor to certain people and ignore others. Did you know that? Did you know like, like a, big, a big cause of detriment in our society is this, neglect. Neglect, lack of love, lack of compassion, lack of acknowledgement. By the way, if I put this across to you, imagine everyone in your circle, everyone at work or everyone in your household treated you like you're invisible. How would that make you feel? I know some very lonely people. They have loads of people around them, but in their circles, they're treated like they're not even there. How horrible a situation to be in. You'd know if, I mean, if they were getting punched and bullied every day, you'd know the cause of that. It's a bit easier to deal with. But if people treat you like you're not even there, sometimes we can be guilty of this as Christians. Sometimes we'll just ignore people and think, oh no, that person wants me to speak to them. Oh, okay, yeah, how you doing, buddy? You're right, yeah, yeah. And treat them as if they don't even exist. Treat them like they're not even a brother or a sister. Would you treat Jesus like that? Because he says, as you've done to the least of my brethren, if you give a cup of water to a little child in my name, he said, even the very lowest of people, people that regard people as nigh and invisible, even if you do good to them, you shall not lose your reward. I see it. I know it happens. And it doesn't just mean like you do it. Oh, this is in the name of the Lord. It doesn't mean that. It means you do it for Jesus sake. You do it in representation of him himself because we are his body. You do it as what the Lord Jesus would do, we would do on his behalf. If we give a cup of water to a young child, I mean, we're doing it on behalf of the Lord Jesus to show the love of God to them. That we have received compassion, love and grace from God and we want to show it through us to them. So he says, even the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. That's what he says. But what we do is we think we get high and mighty sometimes and we think that we don't really have to you know, kind of do that. And James gives the example here. And just a minimal example that happens on a daily basis. Jesus gives us a, a, the example of someone who nearly died, who needed help, and someone came to their help. But James in the New Testament, he gives a very specific example. Look here. Most people think this is very menial, but look here. He says, don't have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Don't treat him different to him. Don't treat her different to her. And he says this in verse two, for if there come into your assembly, a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel. And look here, 
and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. You have two completely different people. And by the way, it says, if they come in unto your assembly, it doesn't say if they vi visit your village community hall, it doesn't say if they visit your home, it says if they come in your assembly, that's referring to a church meeting, by the way, people that gather in the name of God, two people come in, one's got some flash jewelry on, you can tell he, he's got some money, he's got some status, and then you think, hang on, you say, oh yeah, yeah, and then what we do is we give him such flattery, special treatment because he's got money. Someone comes in with dirty clothing, they have a dirty aura about them. And then what we do is we have respect unto him that weareth the gay clothing. By the way, that means joyous, that word. And as a word that's been twisted over the years since like the 1970s and 80s. But that word, he, he has respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. That means he would have had the money to have more colorful garments on. By the way, most people couldn't afford stuff like this back 2000 years ago. We have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place and say to the poor, stand thou there or sit here under my footstool. He's saying, look, 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 look. That's reserved for the person who's got some money, you know. They can sit in a good spot. You stand at the back. But that's an ungodly thing. Look, look how God addressed. You might think nine verses. God would actually give nine verses of the Bible to address something like this. Yes, because it's very important to God. Very important to God. You know what turns most people away from churches? And I'm not just talking about unbelievers that would visit or children that would grow up in a Sunday school. I'm talking about believers that come to a church. You know what turns most people away from fellowship? Hypocrisy in the church. By the way, we're all hypocrites time to time, aren't we? God protect us from it and God change us. We'd admit that, right? But when hypocrisy is tolerated in an assembly, it's disgusting, isn't it? It's disgusting. So when people come in, to a church meeting, and then we show more respect to one person, and you just go at the back, leave as quick as you can. That's having respect of persons. Like, can we really call ourselves Christians? Can we have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ by doing that? By the way, if you change your perspective, your actions will change after. He continues on, and he says this. Are ye not then partial in yourselves? And are become judges of evil thoughts. So he's saying, look, 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 you're imbalanced, you're partial. It's almost like you block something else out and you just put your um, energy and awareness into this, but you ignore this. How can you do that? What poor judgment? Would we not say that judgment is blind? Would we not say stuff like this? Now, I want you to turn to a few scriptures with me or just for the sake of uh, time turning here and there, you can just write these down. Go to the book of Leviticus chapter 19 in the Old Testament, if you can. These laws are what helped England turning into Britain later on is what helped put a foundation that was fair and godly and just into having civil law in this country. It comes from this book that we have here. And you ever heard the term that says justice is blind? It's a biblical concept, not in the same wording, but it's a biblical concept that you shall not, you shall not turn your eyes away from the wicked doing wicked and then pursue and persecute and punish other people unnecessarily because you feel like it, because you have a bias. Now look at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15. It says here, verse 15, ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. By the way, that's not just speaking to a judge that would be in a court. It's talking to believers. He's talking to everyone in that nation of Israel that left Egypt. He gives them laws how to govern themselves in everything. And he says, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shall thou judge thy neighbor. In righteousness shall you make judgments. By the way, we make judgments on a daily basis. If someone gets a new car, if someone does this, we think, is it worth spending all that money on a car? Is it worth doing it? We make judgments every single day. As people, not just as Christians, but everyone makes judgments every day. They read the newspaper. They look at the atrocities. They make judgments. They look at what the government's doing. They look at their neighbor, how they paint their house or their frames or whatever the case. They make judgments every day. We do the same. But he says, you do not do unrighteousness in judgment. Don't treat the poor differently to how you treat the mighty. Don't honor them differently. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter one. The book of Deuteronomy was written 40 years 
after the Israelites left Egypt. Okay, 40 years after is when God reiterates all of these words through Moses. So Leviticus was written when they first leave Egypt. Deuteronomy was written 40 years later. Now Deuteronomy chapter one. These are to a new generation of Israelites that didn't die in the wilderness. Okay, everyone under the age of 20 years old, plus Joshua and plus Caleb, went into the promised land. But everyone that was over 20 years old, they were left to die in the wilderness. They could not enter, God said, because of unbelief. But look at this, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17. One of the first statements, really, that Moses says to the people on behalf of God 40 years later. Look at this, verse 17. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me and I will hear it. Look here. Sometimes we make poor judgments because we want something from someone else. So we're biased and we favor other people more than others. Especially if someone rich is around, we think, hang on, if I kind of buddy up shoulder to them, they might kind of treat me a little bit different. You know, they might get me in their club or they might kind of, if they're getting rid of their car, they might sell it to me a bit cheaper. You know, sometimes we think like that, don't we? Because we're sinful. But here, sometimes we make bad judgments and we respect persons differently because of fear. We're afraid. We're afraid to tell this person that they're in the wrong. We'd easily do it to this person or easily do it to children, no problem. But to correct a brother or a sister and we think, now nah, I, I might be kind of put out the circle if I do that. No, no, the Bible says, you shall not respect persons in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great. You shall not be afraid of the face of man. Righteousness should be far higher on a Christian's priority than man pleasing. And we're always guilty of this and we shouldn't be. And by the way, we do not have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, if we don't practice it. This is the example of loving your neighbor by not respecting persons. You treat this person differently than this person, you're unjust for doing it. I'm unjust for doing it. Now go to the book of, uh, sorry, go to chapter 16. We have time. There's always time to look at the word of God, isn't there? Chapter 16, I, I, could, have, I could have got 50 verses that we could have all looked through here. 50 odd verses. Is that not it? Should we look through them? Shall we? Chapter 16 of Deuteronomy, seeing as you're there. Verse 19 says this. If you're noting them down, that's Deuteronomy 16, 19. Well, let me give you 18 just for context. Again, Deuteronomy means the second law, basically. He reiterates many of the commandments again 40 years later. So Deuteronomy 16, verse 18 and 19 says, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout all thy tribes and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. That means do not take a bribery to mask good judgment. Don't let someone pay you off. By the way, some people, they'll, they'll, they'll let something unjust slide because they get flattery or because they get recognition or they get a little bit of good favor here and there. He says, no, you shall not take a gift for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. Look here. We are righteous, not for our own doing, but we're righteous in the eyes of God and we can live righteous lives with his power and guidance. But look here, if we compromise so that we get something good out of it, so that we get a gift, so that we are, we are receivers of bribery, it says it perverts your vision. Look here, it perverts the words of the righteous and, and it blinds the eyes of the wise. If you want to be wise, you can't do it being blind. If you want to actually have just righteous ways and words and then not be perverted, don't treat people differently for good favor, for bribery in the eyes of God is disgusting. Go to chapter Proverbs 24, please. We'll look at two passages in Proverbs 24. These are commandments and instructions to us that we should already know and follow as Christians. But sometimes we need to hear it over and over. Proverbs chapter 24, please. This is an amazing book. This is, I don't want to say favorites or anything like that, but I, I love this book in a unique way. Not above other books, but I love the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 24, please. Verse 23 says this. 
I'm just doing this so that we get the point, just so that you know the scriptures say this. God is teaching us this today. Proverbs 24, verse 23. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. This is from the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon. He's speaking on behalf of God, obviously, under inspiration. But in the laws of God, it says, you do not pervert judgment. You do not take a gift. You do not fear people to do good judgment. You do not respect persons, whoever they are. It shouldn't be done. And then sometime later, you have Solomon writing in the book of Proverbs. It is not good to have respect of judgment, persons in judgment. Now go across to Proverbs 28, just a couple of pages to the right. So that was Proverbs 24, 23, Proverbs 28, 21. It says this, to have respect of persons is not good. Now we'd all agree it's not good to have respect of persons. Of course, it's not good. But we'll finish off the proverb. It says this, for, for a piece of bread, that man will transgress. I mean, what? What? Someone would sin. Someone would step over the line. Someone would do wrong just for a piece of bread. Yes, because you're your judgment has been perverted because you're a respecter of persons. No wonder people would do such atrocious things. Why? Because they don't look at their fellow man as someone who's been created in the image of God. They don't look at that man as a lost soul. They don't look at him or her as a brother or sister in Christ. When you have respect of persons, it's no doubt that you would, even in small things, pervert yourself and even transgress for a piece of bread. We ought to be aware of this because in small things, we transgress, it leads to bigger things. And we ought to be aware of that as Christians. Don't be a respecter of persons because in God's eyes, you pervert judgment. And in God's eyes, it will lead to more and more and more. Now, just go to, just for the sake of time, I don't want to go to too many scriptures, but there are numerous scriptures about God. These are all instructions to us that I gave you about God not being a respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. Go to Acts chapter 10, please, in New Testament. And then we'll stay in the New Testament. I won't make you go back. Acts chapter 10, please. Acts chapter 10. A friend of mine, he was preaching a sermon. He said, yes, go to the book of Nahum. It's probably those pages that are very stuck together that don't get opened too well. So it's good to flick through your Bible as much as you can. Acts chapter 10. This is a sermon that Peter preaches to some Gentile believers. Okay. Now, Peter, amongst other people, had a perspective that we can only preach and interact with the Jews. We can only do that, especially with those of Judea. We, we can't go to the Gentiles and preach the word of God to them. Even though Peter was from Galilee and the Bible says that it's Galilee of the Gentiles, they would have been around Gentile people all their lives. But after Peter speaks to Cornelius and the other Italian soldiers that are in the Roman army, the first thing that Peter says in this sermon of his, by the way, he ends with these words. He says, to him about Jesus, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. That's in verse 43. At the end of what he says, that's how he finishes it. But look at how he starts it. To give us the right perspective. If a preacher is to preach to the lost or to anyone else about salvation. Yes, we end it. Always end it with going to the cross of Christ and saying that Jesus is the name above every name. All of the scriptures testify that Jesus can give you remission of sins. But Peter starts it like this in verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive God is no respecter of persons. Peter, by the way, earlier on in the chapter, had to be convinced of God of this. Now you might think, what, a spirit-filled man like Peter? He wouldn't go to the Gentiles so that they could be saved. He, he considered them to be lost, yes, but not that he would be the one to give the gospel to them. But he says this, God is no respecter of persons. Romans chapter two, you don't have to turn there, but just for sake of time, I'll read it. Romans chapter two, verse 11 says this. The apostle Paul echoes the exact same thing. Romans two, verse 11 says this. Verse 10 says, but glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. Does God respect the Jews more than the Gentiles? No, he's the God of the Gentiles also. Is God a respecter of persons? No. And then it carries on. In uh, book of Ephesians, in Colossians, it says it. Even in 1 Peter chapter 1. See, you can go back to James chapter 2 if you can. But 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 17 says this. And if you call on the Father 
without respect of persons, judgeth accordingly to every man's work. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Because God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't treat people differently. No. He treats people according as they are. He's fashioned every man's heart alike, the Bible says. So back to James chapter 2. Now, of course, we'd all say, no, 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 no. If someone came into our assembly and they were rich or they had status, we wouldn't treat them differently. Are you sure? Because a stern warning against it. I see it happen all the time, by the way. Now, did you know uh, under Victorian Britain, even before you had to rent a pew in Church of England churches? You know that? The more money you had, the better the pew you had. You'd be able to sit in the gallery. You'd have more comfort. You'd, have, you'd be sat in that good place. You couldn't afford it. You'd go sit over there then. You'd go stand at the back then. We're, we're not supposed to be respecter of persons as believers. Now, you fulfill the law in this. So we'll carry on going because he says this in verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren. Now, I love this. It, James always gives like a sharp, scathing message all the time. But then he reminds them. He says, listen, hearken. My beloved brethren, my Christians who are loved of God, just listen. He says this, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? Now, by the way, we're all poor in God's eyes, aren't we? Even if, if, if you have more money than anyone else in the world, in the eyes of God, you are still dirt poor. Dirt poor. Especially you can't take your money with you when you die. Has God not chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. But ye have despised the poor. God sees them as being rich in faith. God sees them as lost souls. You despise them. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? But you'll dismiss the evil that people do just so that you can maybe get a little bit of goodness from them. You can maybe get a gift or a bit of favor from them. Now look at verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law, that means God's kingly law. God is the king of earth and heaven, by the way. If you fulfill his royal law, that's how we should see this. We shouldn't just see it as commandments. We shouldn't just see it as statements from God. We see it as his royal law. What's good and just and unchanging, his royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt not love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. That's how we can fulfill God's law, if we love our neighbor as ourself. Now look here, look here. This is how we teach children to do good. This is, we say, what about if that person stole your toy? We always teach people, if you can put yourself in their shoes, how would you be? You'd show a lot more compassion, wouldn't you? There would be much more repentance in our lives if we put ourselves in their shoes. And verse 9 says this, but if ye have respect of persons, respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. If you have respect of persons, you sin against God. Should we have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with such poor judgment, poor respect of persons? And by the way, we represent God and who he is as Christians. When an unbeliever looks at your life, they take that as examples of who God is. When a father, when a Christian man gives the example and teachings and his life to his children, they're the first knowledge and, and, and gathering of information that someone could learn about God. How do we represent our Lord and Savior? And this is an example that's clearly taught throughout the whole Bible. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Love them. Not, okay, I won't do bad. No, no, no. Love your neighbor as yourself. Or are you the kind of guy like... All right, but who? Everyone. Everyone. Don't justify yourself. Don't exclude yourself from anything. You love your neighbor as yourself. Everyone apart from you. We're too consumed with ourselves nowadays. We love ourselves. We think of ourselves. We'd be mindful of ourselves all the time, but not of other people. If ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin. Now, most of the time we think, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't really lie at work. I don't, I don't steal. I don't skim from the till or anything like that. I, don't, I, I definitely don't, you know, bully people. You know, I don't kill people. I'm not out committing adultery. I'm not out getting drunk every Friday and Saturday. I'm not doing these things. But if you have respect of persons, you sin. There are sins of commission, yes, but there are sins of omission. 
And that sin of omission is if you do not love your neighbor as yourself. How can we love our neighbor as ourself? We look at them in the eyes of God, through the eyes of God. We think they're, they're a lost soul. How does God see him? How does God see that young lady? If we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, then we will love our neighbor as ourselves. We will. Rather than trying to get commandment number seven, eight, nine, ten down, you know. No, no, no. If we have God in his rightful place, then we'd want to honor God. Would we not? And remember, Jesus is God. He is God. How did he live? How did he act? How did he treat people? And that's how we should. If we have respect of persons, we commit sin. Christians, we shouldn't be like this. We shouldn't. And then that gives the entire context of how James goes into faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. And he even says this, look, show me your faith. Can you show anyone your faith without works? No, because it's just lip service. And he says, I'll show you my faith by my works. By what I do, you'll see how I believe or what I believe in what I do, how I live, how I treat others. My devotion to God and my burden for my fellow man is how I'll declare the word of God. So look at this. Look at yourself. How do you treat people? And by the way, this can be geographical. And by that, I don't mean people from other nations, races, tongues, and tribes. No, no, no. I mean, you come to church, you treat people one way here. And in your family at home, you treat them different. Your work colleagues at work, you treat them different. You know, you say, yeah, please, brother, thank you so much. You know, this isn't a pantomime. This isn't where we dress up and the women look lovely and feminine and modest and the men, you know, they're, they're actually, you know, speaking about the things of God. All week goes by. They go to the shop. No respect. No well-mannered. They don't even care. They want to get in, out as quick as they can. They don't want to deal with anyone. Sometimes we'd be like that. We're so hard, so stiff-necked, so bitter. Why? God gave you another day. He gave you another time to go to the shop. He gave you another opportunity to go to work so that you can be an ambassador for him. So that you can love that neighbor as yourself. If we don't do that, we transgress the law of God. Not yet. We might not go and give them a hard time, but if we don't love them, we break God's law. So love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, you know you should. I no doubt all of you knew that. Probably from little children, you probably knew that. But love your neighbor as yourself. If you do, it says here, look at the words. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. That's what God says. You do well. We are Christ's body here on earth. Jesus Christ will not walk the streets of Chartridge, physically speaking. He does it through us. His spirit has gone throughout the world, has it not? The word of God is not bound, is it? And he'll use us for his glory. He'll use us to reach people. And by the way, there is a big shortage of love in this world, is there not? Do, do we not have a big shortage of love and compassion in this world? Is there anyone, a specific group that we should find love and compassion amongst? I'd probably say Christians. Are you a Christian? Let's show it to the world. Whatever you've done, you can't undo it but you can confess your sins and God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you've done wrong, God has given us confession so that we can get it off our minds and hearts and we can have fellowship with him. And then we can walk in the light as he is in the light, as 1 John says. But if you want to stay the same as what you are, it's not that, yeah, you know, I'll just keep going the way I am. I don't really want to change. If I change, then, you know, people will kind of see that I was being lazy before. People will see that I was being unloving before well yeah, if you change now then tomorrow will be better tomorrow will be different you'll be more useful if you don't change it's not that you won't cause any harm you will you'll turn others away so now is the day of repentance of change of following the lord of taking up your cross so christian do this this really spoke to me i feel like i didn't expound it as clear as i should have but this spoke to me the royal law of god and I fulfill it by loving my neighbor as myself. And if I do that, I do well in the eyes of God. So I think we have some love that needs to be shared and shown to the lost. And God will do that through us. Love is a very hard thing 
to follow in and to walk in and to keep ourselves in, as the Bible says, keep yourselves in the love of God, it's a very hard thing to do because sometimes we, we've been hurt. Sometimes we see the wickedness that goes on in the world and we're grieved very deeply, yes, but God still loved you no matter how much you grieved him. God still saved you no matter how much you wronged him. So may we love our neighbor as ourselves and love the Lord our God with everything that we have.